Great. Good evening. Um, I'm so excited to see so many people here for this event. It's really great. Um, I'm Robin Bates Mason, and I'm rather fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce our honored speaker, Douglas Tallamy, uh, tonight. Uh, tonight's event was organized by New Canaan Pollinator Pathway. In case you are not familiar with the New Canaan Pollinator Pathway, we are comprised of 10 local organizations which came together last year and in April 2019 founded the New Canaan Pollinator Pathway. The objective of this nonprofit coalition is to join the nationwide effort of communities to create pollinator friendly properties of public and private land throughout New Canaan that will build habitat corridors for pollinators, bees, butterflies, birds, insects, and other wildlife. The underlining premise is that through education and action, we all help to restore valuable habitat in our no own neighborhood. I'm lucky enough to be involved with two of the nonprofit organizations that are part of the New Canaan Pollinator Pathway. I'm president of Planet New Canaan and I'm a board member of New Canaan Beautification League. I would like to give a shout out to the other wonderful partner organizations, Grace Farms Foundation, New Canaan Garden Club, New Canaan Land Trust, who took a lead in organizing this event, so a big thank you to them, New Canaan Library, New Canaan Nature Center, The Glass House, the New Canaan Department of Public Works, and the Norwalk River Watershed Association. Getting this group of organizations together to manage their properties and advocate and model better practices to support biodiversity is just a start. We all need to get on the bandwagon in our own backyards. And that is why we are so fortunate as a group to have our first major educational event with Doug Tallamy. Mr. Tallamy is the visionary who started this grassroots approach to conservation. So let me tell you a little bit more about our speaker. Doug Tallamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 95 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is be to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His first book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with, was published in 2007 and awakened the public to the urgent situation of the decline of wildlife populations because native plants they depend on are fast disappearing. Bringing Nature Home was awarded the 2008 Sil Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rich Dark, was published in 2014. Doug's new book, Nature's Best Hope, was just released this February and is available for purchase here from Elm Street Books. Among his awards are the Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dodd Jr. Award of Excellence, the 2018 AHS B.Y. Morrison Communication Award, and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. Without further delay, I'm delighted to introduce Douglas Tallamy. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, and thanks for, thanks for coming. On Super Tuesday, no less. What a way to spend Super Tuesday. Um, we're going to talk about nature's best hope. But before we do that, I want to remind you about this fall. Remember this? This was a, a mass year for red oaks. And what that means is all the red oaks got together and they said, we're going to make all our acorns in one, one year. Uh, and they did, you know, this was from uh, at least southern Massachusetts all the way down to South Carolina. It was a, it was a big meeting of those red oaks. Uh, and that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, if you are, are easily entertained, you might have taken one of, those, one of those acorns and put it on a table and stared at it. And if you stared at it long enough, you might have seen this happening. Um, a little blemish appears right here and it starts to move and what happens is a, a larva is chewing its way out of the acorn. And in no short time, it wiggles and pushes and pops right out onto the, onto the table, onto the leaf in this, this case. Now those larvae are, um, they're very nutritious. They taste really good. So a lot of things want to eat it, which means it's got to get below the surface of the ground as fast as possible. If you put it on soil, it'll burrow down in about 30 seconds, then it's, then it's down, where it stays for two years. It forms a pupa and it stays underground for two years. And when it comes out, it looks like that. It's an acorn weevil. Uh, now, a lot of people think that that is a big nose on the end of the weevil, but that's actually part of the head capsule. The mouth parts are way down here. 
And uh, if it's a female, they use the mouthparts to chew a hole right down to the center of the acorn. Then she turns around and lays an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets into the center of the acorn. It's a very safe and nutritious place to develop. Now, you might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year? Because it takes red oak acorns two years to develop. So if they come out the next year, they won't have any more red oak acorns. Uh, but that leaves a hole in your acorn. If you go out and you look at red oak acorns right now, most of them have holes in them. Uh, but nature abhors a vacuum, so there's actually a group of ants, temnothorax ants, that want to move in to that empty hole that the acorn weevil uh, left. And there they are, they're discovering the hole, and the first thing they do is get excited about it, then they carry their larvae in, they carry their queen in, work very hard, they've got to get inside that hole before another group of temnothorax ants comes. Uh, and then they're in, and you can't tell they're there, you see a little little antenna right there. Uh, so actually, if you went and found a, an acorn right now with a hole in it, it probably has a temnothorax ant colony inside of it. Well, that's just one of the, the uh, intricate interactions that is happening in my yard, probably in your yards too, if you have, have red oaks. And nature is built from, from actually millions of those types of specialized interactions. If you want to have pileated woodpeckers in your yard, if you want to have them breeding in your yard, you've got to have a lot of carpenter ants because that's mainly what they feed their young. And you're not going to have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make the carpenter ants. Uh, you're not going to have 13 species of native bees if you don't have the sunflower pollen that they rear their young on. So a lot of bees are specialized. They're only going to rear their young in the pollen of particular plants. And there are 13 species that use in this area that use sunflower pollen. You're not going to have platycotus tree hoppers if you don't have oaks and so on. Well, today, these types of specialized relationships, nature uh, in, in general, is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't listen to Teddy Roosevelt. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the Grand Canyon, he stood on the edge, and he looked out over the, the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And those were the days where Congress and the president talked to each other. And within a few years, we had the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today, of course, is that uh, there are very few places in the U.S. that we can leave as they were. We've already uh, used almost all of it. About 95% of the U.S. has been used by, uh, in one way or another by us. Very few pristine places left, and those pristine places tend to be at the tops of mountains or places that are essentially unusable. What we've done is we've, we've logged almost everything, uh, and we've tilled it, we've drained it, we've grazed it, We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S. Or we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our, our skies. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from someplace else, invasive species that are now disrupting native plant communities. Uh, in, in essence, we've, we've taken the natural world and chopped it up into tiny fragments of its former self that are each too small and too isolated from each other to support the species within them uh, that we need to run the ecosystems that support us. We had this idea that, that the earth, our nest, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Uh, but we're realizing now that uh, not only were we wrong, wrong, we were really wrong, and we're getting Headlines like this, all too often, this was uh, November 2018, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? This one not too long ago, North America's lost three billion birds in the last 50 years. Let me remind you how big a billion is. One million seconds is 12 days. One billion seconds is 31.7 years. It's a big number. And we've just lost three billion birds. As a matter of fact, the UN predicts we're going to lose a million species uh, to extinction, possibly within the next uh, 20 years, and humans will suffer. They're starting to, to get it. Um, none of those things are options, by the way. We can't allow that to happen, um, because it's, it's the, the effects are not going to be benign. So I could go on about all the, the terrible things that are, that are happening, about the, the pox we have, have visited upon our environment, um, and thus upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk's about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. A cure that's gonna require small efforts from many people, but they're gonna deliver physical and, and psychological and environmental benefits for everybody. 
By the way, insect apocalypse. Uh, what does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? E.O. Wilson told us what it means for the rest of life on Earth way back in 1987. Uh, he said, if we were to lose our insects, he wrote this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. If we were to lose our insects, life as we know it would essentially disappear. Not just change, but disappear. Um, most of the flowering plants would go extinct. Our insects are, are pollinating 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Uh, and if they went extinct, that would dramatically change energy flow through our, our uh, terrestrial habitats, which would cause the collapse of the food webs that support the animals. The amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth, would rot because the, the uh, insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients would be gone. And of course, humans would not survive any of those dramatic changes. Uh, well, the good news is that, that um, we can save our insects, we can save all of nature, and we can do it relatively easily. All we have to do is change the way we treat the land, change, change the way we, we landscape. I think of, of uh, landscaping as if it's like cooking. We cook these days, we cook always for taste. Uh, because we like taste. I like good taste too. So we, we put in so much fat and so much sugar and so much salt into what we, we cook that it kills us. <laughs> but it tastes good. <laughs> well, we're landscaping the same way. We're landscaping for aesthetics. Uh, so we get a whole bunch of pretty plants together, but uh, in doing that, we're not thinking about the role that those plants need to be playing in our, our ecosystems. Uh, so then we're, we're, we're draining our local ecosystems of their vitality and we, we uh, drastically de degrade them when we're only landscaping with aesthetics in mind. So what we need to do is we need to change. We need nothing less than a, a, a full cultural transformation. We certainly have to stop harming the environment. I mean, that's a no-brainer. We can't continue to degrade our environment. Uh, and we can't just stop and leave it as it is. A neutral impact's not good enough either. We have to now actively restore the ecosystems that we have already largely destroyed. And we have to do that everywhere. So that means we have to do it uh, where we live, where we work, where we play, to a lesser extent where we, where we farm. And the reason we have to do that is we cannot live on the planet without functioning ecosystems. Here are just some of the ecosystem services that both plants and animals deliver. How about producing oxygen? It's important. We need that. Um, cleaning water. Plants clean water and they slow its, its uh, journey to the sea. When it rains, that water always ends up in the ocean. And when it's in the ocean, it's too salty for us to use. It's plants that slow it down. It's plants that capture carbon and pump it into the soil. Extremely important ecosystem service these days. As a matter of fact, it's plants that build that topsoil and then hold it in place. If there were no plants on the planet, all the topsoil would be in the ocean. It'd be, it'd be bedrock. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they do all kinds of really important things. What do animals do? Well, they disperse the seeds of those plants, they pollinate those plants, they deliver pest control services, they keep those plants from being totally eaten uh, by, by herbivores. And of course, they, they provide lots of food. So we're now living, we've got a huge population on the planet, and we are living off the ecosystem services that were produced a long time ago. Let's call it ecological interest that was produced when we had an, a healthy ecological bank account. But we're whittling down that interest, and in a lot of places, we've gotten rid of the interest, and now we're picking away the ecological principle of that, that bank account. Um, and you know what happens when you reduce the principal. Then you have less interest in the future, and pretty soon you have no bank account at all. Which means we cannot continue to do that. That's what being over the carrying capacity means. You are using more resources than are generated each year. Can't continue, can't continue. Well, Aldo Leopold knew that, and he recognized that uh, a number of decades ago. He said that... Uh, the oldest task in human history is to live on a piece of land without, without spoiling it. As a matter of fact, uh, we have never succeeded in doing that in the history of, of humans. In the old days, we would spoil an area and then move to another area. And there were so few of us, we could move to another area, uh, and while we were gone, the first area would regenerate. And you could do that back and forth, essentially forever. Then we discovered agriculture and we, we grew our populations dramatically. We were anchored to, to one place. And of course now we have, you know, we're pushing 8 billion people. Uh, there is no place to move to. Um, so we are spoiling those places without letting them regenerate. 
So he said, um, we need to develop what he called a land ethic. He had this dream. We're going to develop a land ethic. We're going to use the land. We're going to farm it and lumber it and graze it and mine it and hunt on it, but we're going to learn to do it without destroying the ecosystems uh, that support us. That's what he called the land ethic. He wrote about that in the Sand County Almanac, uh, still a book that is selling very well. What I'm interested in, though, is that he didn't talk about developing a land ethic where we live. It was always someplace else where we, there weren't a whole lot of humans. Uh, and I'm not sure why. I think it's the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist was and still is so, so deeply embedded in our culture that Aldo didn't seem to recognize it as an option. It's not an option to have land ethic where there's a lot of people. It's got to be someplace else. Well, living with nature is an option, and I'm going to argue tonight that it is the only option left to us, the only viable option. Um, so we need to learn how to do that. We need to, to find ways to coexist with nature in a way that doesn't destroy it, because we're part of it. We totally depend on it. We are not going to live isolated from the natural world. So where are we going to start doing this? I always start talking about private land, because most of the U.S. is privately owned. East of the Mississippi, 85.6% of the U.S. is in, in private property. Uh, and if we ignore that, we say, well, that's off limits, then you only have 15% of the, of the land to, to uh, exercise conservation in. And that is not nearly enough. That will doom our conservation efforts to, to failure. So private land ownership uh, is going to be part of the, the future of conservation, which means if you own land, or even if you don't, if you live in a city and don't own a thing, but you are next to a park, uh, then we need to, to bring that into, uh, we need to increase the ecological integrity of, of both our private properties and our, our public areas. Let's look at some of those public properties that we've never considered as being targets for conservation, but they really could be. How about power line and, and uh, pipeline rights of ways? We've got 21 million acres of, of rights of ways in, in this country, and that's increasing rapidly. This is as of 2014. Think of all the gas pipelines that have been, been built since then. Golf courses, two million acres. Airports. The uh, Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are, these are big areas. Then we've got all the areas where we live in, in rural areas, suburbia, exurbia, urban centers. Road size, we've got 44 million miles of paved roads in the U.S. and all those roads have two sides to them. Railroad rights of ways, you add up all of those types of properties, that's 599 million acres that we could start doing some serious conservation on. How big is 599 million acres? It's bigger than you think. It's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, plus Texas. You add up all of those, 599 million acres. Um, so we're, we're not... There's no shortage of places we can start doing this. And notice, that's without touching farmland. Farmland's a little, little tougher nut to crack, so let's just start with the easy places. Uh, every once in a while, I'll give a, a talk with Rick Dark, and the last time we talked together, he threw up these definitions that uh, I thought was, was interesting. Wilderness is the absence of humans. Okay. Wildness is the absence of control. And his point was that wildness is a renewable resource. And that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. We want to recreate wildness. In other words, recreate functioning ecosystems that can maintain themselves. And we want to do it where humans live, work, and play. Which means we've got to rebuild nature. And we need to rebuild all parts of nature. But let's start with the most important parts. And they will help to rebuild other, other parts. So what are the most important parts of, of nature? Well, I'm going to argue that in terms of, of rebuilding food webs, it's caterpillars. Who says caterpillars are the most important thing? I do, and I'm giving this talk. So. <laughs> but I'm not the only one. Dan Jansen, way back in 1988, said caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of organism that is out there. That immediately makes them really important. Um, so let's use a, a few examples here from birds. I, I use birds because people like birds. There are charismatic megafauna now, the chickadee. 
Um, well, they rear their young almost exclusively on caterpillars when they're in a healthy environment that has lots of, of caterpillars. And in fact, uh, they are not exceptions. Most terrestrial birds in North America are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. And we actually have some data now to support that statement. This is, uh, these are results of a citizen science project that my uh, grad student Ashley Kennedy uh, finished up. Actually, she's still accepting photographs, but um, she's graduated, so. What she did was ask people all over the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were bringing food back to the nest. And the object was to identify the prey items so that we could rank uh, which birds are feeding their nestlings which insects. The green bars, so you're looking at 20 families of, of common birds, and the green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet that is caterpillars. And in 16 of the 20 families across the US, caterpillars are the dominant part of the nestling diet. So in 16 of our 20 most common bird families, what would happen if we took caterpillars away? It would not be pretty for those birds. Uh, so there's something obviously that's special about caterpillars. What is it? Why, why aren't they eating a bunch of beetles and, uh, and other things? Uh, well, there are several things that are special about caterpillars, and one is that they are, they are soft. So think of this caterpillar as if it were a sausage with a very thin wrapper. <laughs> so the thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's undigestible, and the birds don't want a lot of undigestible material. So this is perfect. You got a lot of food stuffed into a, a very thin wrapper, uh, and it's soft. And that means you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird feed its young, they're, they're rough. It's like a plunger. They just <laughs> stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. They have a low percentage of chitin compared to uh, many other types of insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. And they've got a lot of sharp edges, too. And then finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, you're a vertebrate, the birds are vertebrates. We all need uh, carotenoids. They're essential components of our diets, yet we don't make them ourselves. We have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And that's why my wife Cindy says I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene and my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. And she makes sure I, I get all of that stuff because they stimulate my immune system. I am generally healthier when I've had access to lots of, of uh, carotenoids. Excuse me, they are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? They improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about largely the, the uh, uh, male birds here. They take carotenoids and build pigments out of them and put them in their feathers. So this, this prothonotary warbler is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. And the brighter yellow he is, uh, the more ladies he attracts. Very important. Uh, well, they're getting the carotenoids from the prey that they, they uh, find out there, particularly the prey they're bringing to their, their young. Uh, and these are typical prey items, but look, the distribution of carotenoids across those prey items is very different. The first two bars are caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than uh, any other type of, of insect or arthropod. The third bar here is our, our orthopterans, things like crickets and, and grasshoppers and katydids. Uh, so they're rich in carotenoids as well. Look, here's the uh, adult moths and butterflies. They're far lower in carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's their larvae that are eating the green leaves that have the carotenoids. Here are spiders. They're important components of bird diets, but they have even fewer carotenoids. And here's the earthworm way down here. The early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. <laughs> Does this matter when you're a bird and you're feeding your young? Well, Ashley uh, also uh, did this study. She put GoPro cameras on the uh, tops of bluebird boxes, and those cameras took a picture once a second. She had a lot of cameras and a lot of bluebird boxes, and she did it for three years, and it added up to nine million pictures that she had to go through. 
Um, and when she went through them, she got, what, 7,628 good pictures, good enough to identify the prey item that was being brought back. Uh, so she looked at the frequency with which it was being brought back compared to the amount of carotenoids in that prey item. And she got a pretty good relationship. She had the caterpillars way up here, most frequent, uh, and, and also highest in carotenoids, followed by those orthopteroids, and then everybody else was nestled down, down here. All of this suggests that for birds, caterpillars may not be optional parts of the diet. It's looking like they are essential components of the diet. And that means if you are a bird and you're trying to breed in an area and there are not enough caterpillars, you're gonna fail. You're not gonna be able to do it. So we need to build environments with enough caterpillars, but to do that, we have to understand what enough caterpillars is. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of birds? We do have data for chickadees, we get data for four or five other, other warbler species, and it's all about the same. Thousands, thousands of caterpillars, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadees to the point where they fledge. After they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days. But they're flying around, so nobody's counted those. Um, so you're talking about many thousands of caterpillars, and if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, you need that many caterpillars in your yard. They're foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. So when I say we need to build functional ecosystems in our yards, that's what I'm talking about. You gotta make caterpillars. So how do we do that? How do we landscape for caterpillars? Well, you add caterpillars to your landscape by adding the plants that make caterpillars. So far, that's that's... Uh, pretty straightforward, but there is a catch, and that is that most caterpillars are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. So you have to add the plants that make the caterpillars. You can't add any old plant because many of them don't make caterpillars at all. And of course, the monarch butterfly here is a perfect example. It is a specialist on milkweed. If you add crepe myrtle to your yard, it'll look nice, but you won't make any cat uh, monarch caterpillars or anything else, by the way. If you're waiting for monarchs to adapt to crepe myrtle or to ginkgos or to burning bush or to autumn olive, uh, there's a, a saying in Spanish that says, you better wait sitting down. <laughs> because these things are going to disappear long before that happens. And that's, of course, what we've seen with the monarch. We take away the milkweeds and it, it plunges to 3.6% of its original population. Um, well, let's talk briefly about why insect herbivores, why these caterpillars are such specialists on particular plants. Uh, and, the, and the answer is that plants have forced them to specialize. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a, it's a very effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And if you don't believe me, in the spring when the leaves come out, grab a leaf and eat it. See if you like it. <laughs> You're not going to like it. Uh, because every plant lineage protects itself. Uh, you know, th there's a reason we can't get our kids to eat the vegetables that we give them. Because they inherently know the vegetables are toxic. And that's why in the summertime it's green. It's, it's not because there are not any insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of those plants are so well defended, those insects cannot eat those plants. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Um, every plant lineage is defending itself with different chemicals. And insects cannot uh, create adaptations that get around all of those defenses. So they pick one or two plant lineages with very similar defenses, and they get good at getting around those defenses. They develop specialized enzymes that detoxify and store and excrete those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that, that allow them to eat those, to avoid exposure to those compounds, but all of that allows them to eat this plant without dying. Important point is, it takes a long period of evolutionary exposure to those plant lineages for all these adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. Uh, we actually now have, have data about how specialized caterpillars are. Ecologists have been guessing about how specialized they are for the last 40, 50 years. Um, they said, well, most of them are specialized. And some people have guessed about 90% are, are specialized. But we actually have data now, uh, and here it is. 
If you look at this line and say that is a continuum of host plant specialization. At this end of the line, uh, a caterpillar is an absolute generalist. It can eat every plant, 100% of the plants it encounters. And at this end of the, the line, it's an absolute specialist. It can only eat one of the types of plants that it encounters. The red here is the true distribution of host, host plant use of the 7,000 species of caterpillars in the US that we have host plant data for. They're all nestled down here, very close to the absolute specialist. If we blow that up, um, these are the percentages here. These, uh, the stock borer and the light brown apple moth, these are introduced uh, uh, caterpillars that are, they're pretty generalized, but look, they can still only use about 5% of the plants that they encounter. The Iowa moth is our most generalized native caterpillar. It only can eat four point something percent of the, the plants that it encounters. But most of the, the uh, species, the 7,000 species that are out there can eat less than one percent of the host plants or of the plants that it encounters. Uh, so what this is, is saying is that even insects that we once considered to be quite generalized, when you look at all the plants they could be eating but aren't, they're really quite specialized. And what that means is, if you give them plants they haven't encountered in their evolutionary history, chances are really good they're not going to be able to eat them. Plant choice matters. That's all I'm trying to say here, and I'm going to give you some examples of how it matters. I'm going to start with, with our house in Oxford, Pennsylvania. We have 10 acres, uh, and we, when we moved in, it had been mowed for hay. Uh, it was taken out of mowing three years before we bought it, and of course what came back were all the invasive species. This is uh, my wife Cindy here getting rid of these uh, multiflora rose and, and oriental bittersweet and everything else that was there. It was like Sleeping Beauty's castle, you couldn't walk anywhere, but she did it, she got rid of all of that stuff. Uh, and when she did that, I started bringing in plants that would support particular species of caterpillars that I wanted to take a picture of. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I think they're pretty. I mean, <laughs> So I went to take a picture of Canadian owlet. Um, well, in order, to, and, and it's, it's adult that looks like a, a leaf. Um, in order to do that, I had to have meadow root because that's, that's their host plant. Uh, we didn't have any meadow root and there wasn't any meadow root around us that, that I knew of. Uh, so I got some meadow root seeds from, some, from friends of mine. I planted it, it grew up nicely. About a month after I planted it, I was thinking, I don't know how many years it's gonna take to get Canadian owlet. Maybe they gotta come down from Canada. Um, so I went out a month after I planted the plants and they were defoliated. <laughs> the Canadian owlet had come right away. It didn't take long at all. That was a big success. Uh, I wanted the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. Goldenrod stowaway has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's instead, it's on this plant, which is, that's what the caterpillar looks like, by the way. It's on ditch daisy, Biden's aristosa. We didn't have any ditch daisy, so I planted uh, Biden's aristosa. It took a year, but the Goldenrod stowaway came, now I have a good population of goldenrod stowaway. I wanted hackberry emperor because it's a butterfly that ought to be at our house, uh, but of course we had no hackberry, so I planted hackberries. It took them three or, three or four years to come, but now we've got uh, hackberry emperor. I did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own, but when it came in on its own, so did uh, so many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet and the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the goldenrod gall moth. This is what I'm waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth and its, its beautiful larvae. Um, and every year I get to anticipate, it's like the ketchup that doesn't come out. Um, this is our 20th year there now. Still no goldenrod uh, uh, flower moth, but one of these years it's gonna come and it will be, it will be wonderful. Uh, right away we got the, the tephridid fly that makes the goldenrod gall, and of course that's important because in the winter time right now if you cut open a goldenrod gall, you've got this big juicy larva in there, and that is really important in terms of keeping our friend the chickadee and the tip mice and the, the uh, whatever that is, downy woodpecker, alive on the really cold nights because they peck a hole and they, they, uh, they know that larva is in there and most of the galls look like that in the spring. Um, but you gotta leave the galls up there all winter long or they're not contributing to the, the winter food supply of those birds. I planted Virginia creeper and I planted it on my back porch, probably a mistake, but this is why I wanted the, I wanted the Pandora Sphinx and I wanted the, uh, the adult because they're, they're beautiful. I like beauty as much as anybody. But you get a lot of other things that eat Virginia creeper, like the hog sphinx. I didn't know about the hog sphinx. I'm waiting for the, the abbot sphinx. 
more anticipation here. I know they're around, their property is very close, but they haven't hit my house yet that I know of. It will happen. Wanted the zebra swallowtail because I think it's the prettiest of the, of the swallowtails. Uh, and it has a really curious larva that is nocturnal. If you go out and look for your zebra swallowtail larvae during the day, you will never find them. They crawl down right to the bottom of the pawpaw or even off. So you gotta have pawpaws, that's, that's what they are. They are um, pawpaw specialists. And you get your pawpaws, that's good. But you also get the pawpaw sphinx. Again, I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx until I planted these plants and, and in they came. Actually, we got the pawpaw sphinx before the swallowtail. It took nine years to get the swallowtail. The, the nearest population I know of was 26 miles away, but they finally found it. Um, and oaks, and we've done this with a lot of lineages of plants, but um, I had no idea how many things would come to my property when I planted oaks. This is the Bedford oak, by the way. Uh, some of you might know it. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. You do not need an oak that is four or 500 years old to get, get uh, some action at your house. Uh, so I planted oaks, most of them from acorns. None of them are more than 20 years old at this point. But I get the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusk, dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered slug caterpillar, the orange-headed epicolema, the red wash, wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested uh, caterpillar. Uh, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oakworm, the orange humped oakworm, the pink striped oakworm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the oblique heterocampa, the red line, no, that's the, the white blotch heterocampa, that's the oblique heterocampa, there's the red line penipoda, the laugher, and many, many more won't be there unless you have oaks in your, in your yard. And that is true for 84% of the counties in North America. Oaks produce more caterpillars than any other plant. So if you're trying to support these food webs, that's a good place to start. Um, so here's uh, the same perspective that I took that first picture uh, of our yard. We do have a little lawn here, uh, but we have um, all of those moths and, and many others because we put the plant lineages that support them. I and mean, I started counting the number of moths that we have at our house and I'm up to 905 species so far. Just moths, not butterflies. And I, I stopped because it's winter time. But uh, when I continue, uh, the, it'll grow. It's probably going to top out a little bit more than a thousand, uh, but I'll let you know next time. And because we have so much, each one of those species is bird food. We've got so much bird food that we now have had 55 species of birds breeding on that, that uh, 10 acres. Um, so point is, you put the plants back, everything else comes. But I know what you're thinking. You don't have 10 acres, you're living in the middle of suburbia, and it's not going to work in suburbia because it's too small. Well, is that true? Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's uh, property in Kirkwood, Missouri, right outside of St. Louis. Uh, they have 0.6 acres. It was covered with bush honeysuckle. That's a major invasive out there in the Midwest. So they removed the bush honeysuckle, they put in their native plants, and they put in a, a little water feature they call a bubbler. Uh, and so many bird species have come to their 0.6 acres. Uh, 149 species, in fact. Uh, 35 warbler species. I've only recorded eight so far. So they're doing so good at attracting uh, particularly birds that uh, Margie has started a blog, she's been doing it for several years now, where she takes pictures almost daily of the birds at her, in her backyard, and she blogs about it. So 0.6 acres, it works there as well. Um, what about urban yards? Well, let's go to Pam Carlson's yard in uh, Chicago. As a matter of fact, her yard is right next to one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. It is one half block from Chicago's Kennedy Expressway. Uh, there is no connectivity with preserved land anywhere. And it's only one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in the U.S. Well, she added 60 native plant species to her backyard, not her front yard, because her front yard is, is just a cement pad where she parks her car. That's it. So 60 native plant species to her backyard. She added a water feature, and she's, that's an old figure. Uh, she's up to 113 species of birds that have used her yard, including a woodcock. You want to see a woodcock? Go to Pam's yard next to O'Hare Airport. <laughs> what about city centers, though? Is it going to work in cities? Uh, well, in 2014, I was, I was looking at this, this butterfly weed, which reminds me, butterfly weed is, is uh, it's a good native plant. It's Asclepius tuberosa. It's one of the milkweeds but we shouldn't call it a weed. 
because that gives you cultural permission to kill all the native plants that we call weeds. A weed is a plant out of place. Butterfly weed is, is not out of place uh, here in, in North America. Anyway, I was looking, so we're, let's call it Monarch's Delight, and then we don't have to kill it. I was looking at it, and the first thing I saw was, was uh, this megachylid bee. It's a leafcutter bee. I know it's a leafcutter bee because it, it gathers all of its pollen on its tummy, not on its legs. So there it is on its tummy. It was there, but it's got pretty specific requirements. Not only does it need pollen and nectar, it needs soft leaves because it takes that pollen and it rolls it up in soft leaves, things like redbud leaves, cuts little corners out of the edge there. You've probably seen that rolls up the pollen in there and then stuffs it in a crack someplace and that's how it lays an egg on it that's how it reproduces uh, well there were red bud leaves there uh, and there was pollen and nectar and i'm sure there were cracks someplace so so there were mega bees i saw two species of them uh, bumblebees as well well the red bud is perfect for queen bumblebees because it's one of the first things to bloom and the queens need to do all their foraging before they build up a colony and they need lots of, of nectar and pollen to do that and then there were a lot of other uh, uh, blooming plants there as well. But then I saw a monarch. Now this was 2014. In 2013, I went the entire season without seeing one monarch. So the monarch was at uh, you know, a really low point back then. And this was also June. It takes a long time for monarchs to get up this far north uh, on the, the east coast. And June is early, but I saw not one, but two monarchs were there on the Monarch's Delight and also other species of milkweeds that were in this planting. The question is, where was I? I was on the High Line. I was in the middle of Manhattan. There's the, the Asclepius. Uh, millions of people are, literally, millions of people around construction. I mean, this is, this is not what I would consider uh, a haven for nature, but there it is. You put in, you know, some thoughtful plantings of native plants. The High Line is not 100% native, but it's enough to attract a lot of life, far more than I ever thought um, you would be able to attract to the middle of Manhattan. So if we can do that in Manhattan with a tiny strip of planting, we can do it anywhere. We can do it anywhere. There are some keys to success, though, that I want to talk about, things that we really need to consider if it's going to work big time, and we want it to work big time. And one of them is, uh, we've got too much lawn. We've got to shrink the lawn. Um, you know, that looks like gone with the wind. <laughs> and it's beautiful if you like lawn, but all the life there that used to be there is, is definitely gone with the wind. We have... We have an area of lawn the size of New England right now in the U.S., and we're still adding hundreds of square miles of lawn to the U.S. every, every year. So it's more than uh, 45.6 million acres. That's an old figure at this point. But what if we cut that area in half? What if everybody reduced the amount of lawn they had, cut it in half, and put in powerful plants that, that made lots of caterpillars? Um, we would have 20 million acres to work with. We could create a new national park, and if we do it at home, we could call it Homegrown National Park, and it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. It will be the biggest, by far, national park in the lower 48 states. What are the benefits of building homegrown national park? There are many. First of all, you get to enjoy nature at your own pace, at your own, your own time. This is really important, particularly for kids. You know, right now, Richard Louvre wrote a book, Last Child in the Woods. Everybody's trying to get the kids on a bus, take them to, to the natural areas. And that is better than nothing. It truly is, because it's their only exposure to nature. But I'm going to argue it's not, not good enough. Because what do they get exposure to? They get exposure to 30 other kids running and screaming through the woods with teachers telling them what they're not allowed to do. And then they get on a bus after an hour and say, well, there's my exposure to nature. Here, if it's in their yard, they can go outside and they can do whatever they want when they want to do it. And, and everybody uh, learns and, and experiences nature at their own pace. You can avoid crowds. How many millions of people go to the Great Smoky Mountains every year? It's either 4 million or 40 million. I don't know. But when you go down there, you sit in a traffic jam. Same thing with, with Yellowstone. It's free. You don't have to pay a fee. You can avoid all the, the travel hassles. Um, and you can experience the world alone. There's a lot of research now on the medical benefits of, of being exposed to, quote, nature. And I've, I've read the books on this. Being exposed to nature is walking in a park. I don't think there's any birds around or anything. They're walking in a park, and they're walking in a park with electrodes on their head, 
and it's usually in a group of five or six people. So again, they go walk in a park uh, and experience other people with electrodes sticking out of their head for, for half an hour, and then they measure whether there's a change and say, well, exposure to nature helps. There's always a positive change, but I think they could do a lot better if they sat in their yard without anybody else around. The real benefit is you get to hunt lizards in the privacy of your own home. And I learned this from my granddaughter who sent me this picture. Um, she's deadly serious, folks. Lizard hunting is important. What you have to do is you have to get on the ground and creep very slowly, but you have to disguise yourself with sticks and leaves. <laughs> and you can wear your, your best dress while you do it. But um, she, she actually lives in Hawaii. Her, her front yard is about the size of that table, but she's still experiencing nature. And believe me, when she grows up, she's going to remember hunting lizards, which are the anoles that are crawling all around. That's what I mean by, by discovering it uh, on, your, on your own. No adult supervision there. Okay, number two. Um, we need to, the plants we're going to put in half the area that's in lawn have to be the plants that are, that are the most valuable. I'm calling them keystone uh, plants. Um, thinking of the keystone, the Roman arch uh, with the keystone in the middle of it, if you take the keystone out of that arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take these plants out of your food web, the food web collapses. About 5% of our native plants in any place in the country are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives these food webs. So if you don't have these 5%, even if it's 100% native, you're going to have a failed food web. The point I want to emphasize here is that there are a few natives that are much better than the other natives. So all natives are not equal. It's too bad that they're not, but they're not. So we want to focus on those really powerful ones. The question is no longer, are natives better than non-natives? We know that they are on average, uh, you know, no doubt about it. But the question really is, can we put really ecologically productive plants in our yards? Or are we going to be happy with, with ecologically destructive plants or, or even just benign plants? That's, that's the question that we're facing these days. I still get emails um, a couple a year where somebody says, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from, from Asia, grew in North America 7 million years ago? Therefore, it's native, therefore I can plant it. Yes, I do know that ginkgo grew in North America 7 million years ago, but I don't care if they grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They support zero caterpillars. So the metric now is how biologically active are they? And if you want to restore the nature around you, ginkgos aren't going to do it. This is what's going to do it. Oaks, 557 species in the mid-Atlantic states. And that includes Connecticut, by the way. Um, species of bird food. No other plant is, is as productive as that. So let's just look at what that means for the 905 species of caterpillars on my property. Um, so out of that 905, we only know the host plants of 800 of them. Um, so, so there's 105, we don't know what they eat. Some of them might eat oaks, but we don't know that yet. So out of that 800 species, 242 of them do use oaks. Now we have 59 genera of native plants, native woody plants on our property. Quercus, the genus Quercus, is only one of them. That means that oaks represent less than 2% of the woody plant diversity on our yard, but they're supporting more than 30% of the moth species. That's what a keystone plant is. What would the, my caterpillar count be if I had no oaks at all? Point three, there's, there's another catch here. Keystone plants work really well unless you have a lot of lights around, uh, which is too bad because I'm telling people to put these oaks in your yards and what do we have on all night long? We've got lights everywhere. We've got street lights, we've got, we've got security lights, well, those lights attract moths all night long, and they kill them all night long. After 100 years of research, nobody knows why moths are attracted to, to lights. And it's not just moths, other insects as well. But they're flying around there. The bats come and eat them. They sit on the wall. And in the, in the morning, the birds learn that is where breakfast is, and they come pick them off. Um, many moths don't even have mouth parts. All the energy they're ever going to use as, a, as adults, they got as a larva. And if they spend that energy flying around the light all night long, then they're done. They've used it up. They can't go off and mate and, and reproduce, reproduce. So typically, a trip to a light is a one-way trip for, for a moth. If you are worried about security, and that's what most people say, I've got to have the, the light on or the bad man will come, put a motion sensor on your light so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And if you do that, you will be surprised at how often the bad man does not come. 
But look, when it's on, it throws really dark shadows. The bad man knows exactly where to hide. When it's off, he doesn't even know it's there. And if it flicks on, believe me, then he, he runs away. But if you don't want to do that, then replace the bulb with a yellow bulb. And a yellow LED bulb is the least attractive to insects. So all of your lights, whether they're security lights or not, you could, you could change them out in one day. And if we did that this next coming summer, across the US, we would save billions of insects instantly just by putting in LED lights. This is, a, this is the simplest of all the insect decline solutions that are out there. Um, all right, what are keystone species? Well, you go to Native Plant Finder or the uh, Audubon has a, a similar website called Plant, uh, uh, Plants for Birds, I believe it is. Uh, put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, woody and herbaceous plants will come up there, ranked in terms of their ability to produce caterpillars in your county. So this localizes it. Um, you don't have to take general figures for the whole country. You can be specific about your county, every county in the country. So uh, right here, where are we? In Connecticut? Yeah. <laughs> Oaks, cherries, willows, birches, aspens, uh, maples, they're the, they're the uh, top ones. But you know, the, it goes right down the list. You've got, you've got a lot of woody plants here. Uh, and notice I say native oaks, native cherries. You can get non-native oaks and you can get non-native cherries. And most of the cherries that are for sale are non-native. They're Chinese cherries that are, are, are blooming. But um, we've compared them. On average, there's a 68% reduction when you use a non-native member of a native genus. 68% uh, reduction in the number of insects using it. So stick, stick to the natives. We have over 90 species of oaks. You don't need to use the Chinese oak. You just don't. Herbaceous plants, goldenrods number one, asters number two, uh, the, the uh, sunflowers, and I don't mean the big seed producing guys, the, the perennial sunflowers. They're much more common in the west, but we do have a few species here in the east. Uh, and by the way, these guys are, are also really important in terms of specialist bees. We already, we already talked about that. Um, so, we, wondering what we should have in our yard, that's not, not a good excuse anymore because we now, now know. Number four, when we plant for caterpillars, we have to allow them to complete their, their life cycle. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm in Chester County, Pennsylvania. And in Chester County, Pennsylvania, there are 511 species of caterpillars that use oaks. A few of them complete their development on the oak. So this polyphemus moth is one. It's, it's a, a beautiful caterpillar. It eats the oak leaves. It spins a cocoon and hangs from the branch. Then the adult moth comes out and they do it all over again. And everything happens on the tree. But that's unusual. 480 of those species, 94%, actually drop from the tree and they pupate in the soil. If the soil's nice and loose, they crawl under as caterpillars uh, and they form a, a, a pupa under the soil or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter. And you see where I'm, I'm going here. There is no leaf litter. Uh, and this is hard, compact soil that is, is walked on and mowed all the time. Uh, and this is, this is so common. Any caterpillar that's developing up here is going to drop down and probably not make it. Uh, and the cement landscape, of course, is, is even uh, <laughs> going to be less effective. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities. I'm trying to discourage the use of cement. That's a default that is just because we're lazy. Uh, and we don't mind sacrificing our watersheds because no, nobody wants to take care of it. That's, that's not a good excuse. This is the typical scenario. We plant trees and we put lawn all around it. And we're going to measure, start measuring this summer what the survivorship of caterpillars is in a situation like that. Um, we don't know, but I can guarantee it's going to be higher in a situation like this, where you have a tree then you've got a layered landscape. Here's a native azalea and you've got ferns and you've got ground cover. This is where you do your spring ephemeral gardening. You're not going to trample it. You're not going to mow it. The ground won't be compact and the caterpillar will fall down and be able to complete its development. Put in your ground covers here, your wild ginger, your may apples, your, your native pachysandra, a lot of choices here. And those are safe sites for all those caterpillars. And it's also a perfect way to reduce the lawn. You build beds around every one of those trees and now there's not grass there, you've got less lawn. Um, you know, there's, there's room for compromise. Uh, and this is, this is important. Um, um, I learned this from my uh, recent PhD student, Desiree Narango, who is now doing a postdoc in uh, uh, Massachusetts. She compared chickadee reproductive success in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. So inside the Beltway in Washington, um, she put up chickadee houses and she looked at how well they reproduced 
over a three-year period, depending on the, the plants in the landscape surrounding those birdhouses. So she was able to compare landscapes that were largely non-native plants with landscapes that were largely native plants. None of them were, were uh, perfectly native or perfectly non-native. When they were largely non-native, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, the amount of bird food available for the chickadees was reduced 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. The parents came, they looked around, nice nest box there, but um, these are probably second year birds that know where the caterpillars are and they said, they're not gonna be enough food here, we're not even gonna try to reproduce here. If they did try, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs, those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. Those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and the, they, it took them 1.5 days longer to reach maturity and the chicks that left the nest were lighter than the chicks from native habitats, so they had less of a chance of surviving. So that doesn't seem like huge differences, but when you put it all together into a population growth model, this is what you get. As a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass in your landscape. The dotted line here is replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live very long, so some die every year, you gotta make that many babies. If you make the same number that die every year, you've got a steady population. That is a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults are dying, you've got a growing population, but if you make fewer than adults are dying, you've got a shrinking population. So anything below that dotted line is a an unsustainable declining population. And they overlap right here around 30% non-native plant biomass. So if you have 70% of the plant biomass in your yard native, you can have sustainable chickadee populations and I'm sure it pertains to other birds as well. Um, but that's the good news here. This, this, this says we can, we can have some compromise. You know, I looked up compromise, the word compromise in the dictionary the other day. It's not there anymore. Maybe this study will help put it back. <laughs> you can have your crepe myrtle. You, no, we're not gonna allow any invasive plants. Those are ecological tumors that won't stay in your yard. But, but you can have your ginkgo as long as it's less than 30% of the plant biomass in your, in your yard. Uh, and that's good because if I stood here and said, you can have no non-native plants, it wouldn't be very popular. Some of you would do it, but not many, not many. Um, most of our, our beautiful plants that we like to garden with are small perennials anyway. Um, so it's okay, you can do that, you can do that. Can you use natives in informal designs? Um, somebody sent me this slide just the other day. This is a land manager, he's into natives, uh, but he's sneaking in native plants in this formal design. He's not telling the, the <laughs> Whoever owns this, this is a, it's supposed to be a replica of the gardens of Vers Versailles, but he's, not all these plants are native yet, but that's his goal to get them in there. And it just points out that formality is a function of the design, not the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the, all the time. And I guess it's okay because they're non-native over there. But um, How are we gonna get a, here's a typical suburban yard. How are we gonna get a pollinator garden in this yard um, that, you know, typically they're not very, very formal. Well, they did it and they put a little fence around it and they're offering a lot of nectar to, to local pollinators. And it, it just struck me that the, the addition of that little fence added enough formality that it, all of a sudden it seems okay. So fooling around with things like this makes it socially acceptable and that's what we have to do is find ways to do this. What can municipalities do to help us live with nature? Um, they can do lots of things. The state of Minnesota, has a cost sharing program where if you agree to get part of get rid of part of your lawn or all of your lawn they will um, help pay for it you have to you have to pay a little bit too but they're what that does is giving you cultural permission look this is such a good idea that we're going to help you pay for it and when your neighbor says oh that's ugly I say, well, the state is paying me to do this you know. <laughs> It changes everything. It, you're no longer the, the, the rebel. You're the, you're the good citizen following the rules. An island in Florida off the, off the Keys is paying its residents to allow the, the burrowing owl, it's a threatened species in Florida, to burrow in their front lawns. If you have a burrowing owl, you get paid now. And this is, this is the way the Endangered Species Act should be working. People would be fighting to have endangered species on their property instead of killing them so they don't get taxed for it. Um, Missouri has a, it's, it's like a bounty on calorie pear. 
You don't actually get paid, but if you get rid of it, if you bring in a calorie repair body, they will give you a, a free tree to replace it. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, so there's a lot more. You know, we, if we changed our tax structure, we could, we could be done overnight. Everybody would, would be doing this if we changed our tax structure. Okay, I think we've made three missteps in, in our early years of, of conservation. And one of them is that we assumed that nature was important important but not essential i mean you look at the top 10 things we're worried about at election time and soon that list will be coming out saving biodiversity is not on there it's never been on there uh maybe this year but i don't think so i don't think so so you know important but but we don't really need it i went to uh, the cincinnati zoo not long ago and this is a wall size poster it says we've got to save wildlife for future generations and to me i've heard that for for years to me, that suggests that nature is, we, just, we want our kids to be able to appreciate it and, and see a rhinoceros and see an elephant, but it's just for our entertainment. We have to save wildlife so we have future generations. That ought to be the message. That ought to be the cultural message these days. Second misstep is we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. We already talked about this, but that means we're going to restrict, if, if we continue to believe that, we're going to restrict conservation efforts to untouched areas that have no humans, which means they'll be too small and too isolated uh, and, and it's going to fail because those areas will have small populations in them and small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. They all fluctuate and a small population often fluctuates and hits zero and then, then it's gone. David Quammen has this uh, analogy between Persian rugs and ecosystems. That is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 scraps that aren't, aren't functioning as a Persian rug. That's what we've done to our ecosystems. Roy Dennis is a land manager in England, and he said land ownership is more than a privilege. It's a responsibility. And what he's saying is, there's, there's planet Earth. That is the biosphere that you're looking at, that thin film of life on the surface of the earth. If the earth were an egg, the, the biosphere would be thinner than the eggshell. That's, that's how thin the area of life is. And as far as we know, it's all the life in the universe. And it's certainly all the life in the universe we're ever gonna interact with. It's right there in the biosphere, but we have chopped it up into private land ownership. Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns this, Mary owns that. Okay, but along with that private land ownership comes the responsibility of stewarding all the life in the universe. I can't think of a more awesome responsibility but we haven't been thinking that way. We haven't been thinking that way. We also have to start thinking about what we do on our private properties doesn't stay on our private properties. This is not Las, like Las Vegas. <laughs> if you mess up your private land, it can harm you, but it's also gonna harm the ecosystem that's supporting everybody around you. There are negative ramifications for people everywhere. And that, again, that's not something we've been thinking about. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, and I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every inch of the planet has ecological significance, particularly in these years with such hu large human populations that demand so many resources, and that includes our yards. So what we need to do is we have to glue these pieces back together again by putting the plants back in those human-dominated landscapes where we've thought we couldn't live with nature. It's not gonna be that hard. It's really not gonna be that hard. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to a few specialists. We haven't seen it as an inherent responsibility for every human being on the planet. Everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why doesn't everybody in the planet have the responsibility of maintaining those ecosystems? A few scientists, a few, few conservationists cannot do it. We can no longer leave conservation to the conservationists. We are now all conservationists. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, although it's a good living. But you can, you really should think about saving it where you live. And I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. This is a big problem. This is a big problem. It's going to take each one of us. But it also shrinks that big problem down to something that's manageable. Just worry about your own property. Worry about your own local park. That's something we can manage. Get rid of the invasive species, shrink the lawn, put in a pollinator garden, put in those keystone plants, and maintain it, and you're done. So as, as property owners, 
each of us has the power to fix dead landscapes like this. We have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do that is going to determine nature's fate, and it's going to determine our own fate in the future. You are nature's best hope. Thank you very much. Swiss cheese. That means something was eating them. <laughs> That's good news. Um, well, it's it's one of those caterpillars I'm talking about. Do you guys have winter moth here? Not yet. It's it's something else. Um, there, it's it's probably if it happened in the spring, it's probably uh, a um, it's a tiny little micro lip that eats small circles, and then as the leaf grows, those circles get bigger. This brings up an important point. Trees can withstand a lot of herbivory, a lot of what we would call damage, without really hurting themselves. So uh, an oak, like gypsy moth, comes through and it defoliates our oaks. Most oaks can take that for a year. Most oaks can take that two years in a row. If they're on, on poor soil, a third year will kill them, so that's, that's too much. But having a little bit or even a lot of, of shot holes in your leaves for, for one year or even a couple years is probably just fine. So right now, it, you know, it looks damaged and you're worried about it, but um, I would say, hey, I just made a lot of bird food. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Robin here. Hello. Um, it wasn't brought up, but what is your opinion on having a bird feeder? Having a bird feeder? Yes, compared to the economy. Okay, what is my opinion on having a bird feeder? Uh, in the winter time, I think it's a great idea. Uh, there are, I've heard ornithologists say, birds don't need bird feeders, they can feed themselves. Well, they can feed themselves if there's enough food out there. But in most places, um, believe me, there is not enough food out there. And there are birds that are being maintained through the winter because of our bird feeders. You want to do it responsibly. The, the seed should not be rancid. You don't want to have too many feeders close together. You know, occasionally that sharp shin hawk comes and gets one of the birds. You say, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. But the sharp shin hawk has to eat too. He's, he's got to find birds someplace. Uh, so studies have shown that birds with access to feeders and suets enter the breeding season. So these are all birds that overwinter. They're not migrants. They enter the breeding season heavier, and they lay more eggs because of that. Um, so done responsibly, it's good. The real question is, should I have a bird feeder up during the summertime when everything's leafed out? Uh, and if you landscape the way I'm suggesting, no, you don't need that. It is much harder to maintain that seed without it going rancid. It gets too warm. Um, I know they have suet now that doesn't melt, but um, I think it's a, it's a much better idea to let the birds do it uh, naturally during the summer, particularly when they're reproducing. Uh, but this is, this is the catch-22. You've got to give them enough food to do that. A lot of people put out mealworms for uh, bluebirds and things, and they'll certainly take them. They've got a lot of foraging to do each day, so they will do the easiest thing. But it doesn't mean the mealworms are the most nutritious thing. They're not caterpillars. They're beetle larvae. And if you remember our, our uh, carotenoid chart, beetles are way down there. So they're getting a, a, a cheap, easy meal, but it's not as nutritious as a, as a caterpillar. So supplement a little bit, but I would say let them do it on their own during the summertime. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, the, a lot of people are talking about making meadows and they all have seeds at the top or your black-eyed Susans have seeds, the goldfinch are hanging from them. If you deadhead them or cut them down in the fall, you've just eliminated all the seed those birds could use all winter long. Um, there's another thing. 
the dead stalks are where a lot of our native pollinators nest. And uh, I used to think, I was wrong, I think a lot of people thought this, that they spent the winter in those dead stalks. They do, but not the dead stalks from this past year. You leave a stalk up, they will nest in it the following summer and stay in it the following winter. So there's a whole year displacement. This is another argument for when you're mowing your, your meadows, mow a third, a third, and a third. Don't do all of it in one year. And the two thirds you don't mow in any one year will help recolonize the, the third that you do mow, or that goes for burning too, burn a third, a third, a third. Because mowing or burning any time of the year eliminates all that stuff, and then it has to be recolonized from someplace else. Thank you. Um, so I'm not baking my leaves, I'm not cleaning up my flower beds, and um, frankly, it looks like a catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot easier, it's not as much work, uh, but I'm, I do have to do a bit of cleanup. And can you tell me what to look for? At what point can I do a bit of cleanup in the garden? I think you just answered it that some of it, and I have noticed that even birds shelter in the perennial beds over the winter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you compromise. Okay. You compromise. So uh, this is going to spread a lot faster if we do it within the cultural bounds that exist right now. Um, many people think that if it's not neat as a pin, it's going to lower the property value and you'll be tossed out and all that. Um, so if you have, I, I say I would do the, the messiest stuff, that is what you could do in the backyard. And you should have the neatest stuff in the front yard. That's what's on public display. Um, you, can have, you can have your leaves and your flower beds. You know, if you have, like right now, I've got a thick layer of, of, of oak leaves all over my phlox bed. And actually, uh, two days ago, I, I raked them off because the phlox are starting, they want to come up now. Um, so it depends on what's underneath there. But bare soil, you should never rake down to bare soil. Uh, because that just erodes and, and that's not what we should do. But for the things that are going to start growing actively in the spring now is when you do that cleanup. Yeah. There's a question. Um, are birds partial, partial to particular insects or will they just eat anything they come across? Most birds, um, you know, they're bringing back hundreds of, of caterpillars per day to their nest. If they said, I'm only gonna eat one kind of caterpillar, that'd be really tough, really tough. So they generally will take anything that tastes good, uh, and even they will take non-native caterpillars too, as long as they taste good. So I mentioned the winter moth, it's a geometric moth, it's a problem in Boston and other places. Um, tastes fine, it's not well protected, and the birds love it. Gypsy moth, on the other hand, it's a non-native caterpillar, but it's all hairy. Birds don't like hairy caterpillars because the hairs dislodge and get in their, their uh, stomach. Unless you're a cuckoo, a yellow bill or a black bill cuckoo, they only eat hairy caterpillars. They're specialists on hairy caterpillars because they can throw up the lining of their stomach and their esophagus and get rid of those hairs. Um, but most, most birds do not discriminate ag uh, among the insects other than saying, I want more caterpillars than crickets than, than spiders. Question over here. Um, I think it's a fine idea. Do you, are the birds using it? Um, I just moved to Connecticut. They hated it in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the ones I showed you, the ones that are definitely very successful are, are in ground. They're a little bit bigger. Um, you want to make sure the water is clean. But the fact that it's, it's bubbling is supposed to be the really attractive part. They like the sound of falling water because falling water typically is clean. Um, I can't answer your question. <laughs> question here. I think, you know, it's, it's better than nothing, so. Um, uh, hi, Professor Chalamet, thanks so much for coming. Um, you didn't mention the use of pesticides and herbicides very much in your talk. No. Um, can you talk about that and, and why we should be concerned about indiscriminate use? 
Okay, I actually have a different talk called Making Insects. Uh, and of course, killing them with pesticides is not what we're trying to do here. Homeowners use more pesticide per acre than is used in agriculture. And almost all of it is absolutely unnecessary. We do that because of entomophobia. We see an insect and we think it's bad and we're gonna kill it. We see a spider, we gotta kill it. And the pest, pest control industry encourages that by knocking on your door saying, I, I saw a spider, I will come and kill it. All you have to do is give me $500. And people say, okay. Totally unnecessary. Most of those insects are absolutely harmless. They're not gonna hurt your house. Uh, termites, different story. You gotta do something to control the termites. But, um, so minimize in insecticide use. Mosquito fogging. Mosquito Joe is running around the country undoing everything I do almost every night by spraying everything I just told you to put in your yard. And he says, well, I'm spraying, I'm spraying pyrethroids. It's a natural product. It only kills mosquitoes. Wrong. Kills every insect it touches. Um, and it's natural, so it's organic. True. It comes from a plant. But so does cyanide. <laughs> it's still a, a, a poison. Um, does it kill mosquitoes? That's the question. Uh, studies have shown it contacts 10% of the adult mosquitoes uh, in your yard, all this mosquito fogging. Uh, you need to control 90% of the adult mosquitoes to control mosquito populations at the adult stage. So any, any good mosquito control guy knows you control mosquitoes in the larval stage, and you do that with mosquito dunks. You get a bucket of water, you put in some straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple days. The, mosquito, the adult female mosquitoes lay their eggs in that water. They love that, that mixture. Then you put in your mosquito dunk, the eggs hatch, the larvae feed on the dunk, and, and they die. Totally specific, only kills mosquitoes. You're not fogging anything, and it does control mosquitoes. Throw a few mosquito dunks in your sewers on your street, because that's where most of your mosquitoes are coming from. But fogging adults doesn't work, it's expensive, and it kills everything else. It's a no-brainer. I don't want to talk about herbicides. <laughs> you Well, the, uh, the larvae aren't in the flocks. They're in things like dead stalks, like uh, goldenrod, and yeah. You you can do it patchily. You know, the, the old thing that used to control meadows was uh, was grazing, which is always patchy, and it was fire, which is patchy. When we mow, it's it's everything. When nothing. Okay, that's another, another thing. They have learned that if you, if you leave two feet, you can cut off the top because the bees are always nesting in two feet within the ground. So that, that will neaten it up a little bit. Yes, you, you've got to leave it or the bees can't be in it. So. Question here. How do we respond to the threat that, oh, that tree, that old growth oak is a danger. It might fall on your house in a storm. What's a good way to counteract that? that fear. Who's, who's giving you that advice? The tree man? The de yeah, the developer who's yeah. building next to me and cutting down all the trees. Right. Sure. I mean, you know, if it's, if it's conflict of interest, you can take it for what it's worth. Does that mean trees never fall on houses? No. Um, we plant every tree as if it's a specimen tree. We want nothing around it so that it develops to its full grandeur. Uh, and we've done that for a century. The new thinking, though, is to plant tree groves, two or three trees close together, far closer than you ever would have thought. And you start young. So put in three young oak trees on maybe 10-foot centers, much closer than you would do normally. They will grow up in a, in a group, and their branches will overlap. You will enjoy their aesthetic as a little grove of trees. Excuse me. But their roots will form a matrix underground, and they will stabilize each other. So when the big wind comes, they won't blow over. If you get a tornado, they'll snap off. And if you get a tornado, I can't, can't help you. 
But, but the average thunderstorm that's pushing all these trees over, there's nothing to anchor their roots. It's not the way trees grow in a forest. They're all, all uh, locked in together. So that's the best way to, to fight that. For these big existing trees, um, <laughs> yes, at some point they could, could fall over. Oaks are really sturdy, though. If I had a tulip tree, big tulip tree ne next to the house, I might think about it because they're, they're a lot less sturdy. That's where, you, that's where you put that big oak. Everybody loves a big oak tree. Well, I said reduce the lawn, cut it in half. So the lawn you keep, you're going to manicure, you're going to mow it. It's going to be beautiful. It's a cue for care. It shows your neighbors you, you have a plan here, that this is a designed uh, property. You're going to have trees now that you didn't used to have, and then you're going to have shrubs under those trees and, and beds around them, but it's all going to result in less lawn. You're going to put the lawn where you walk, because that's the perfect plan to walk on without, without killing it. And you don't have to do it overnight. Just start adding these things when you get a chance. If you have planted one tree a year, in 10 years you get 10 more trees. That's, that's great. Question here. Hi. Uh, we have a, uh, ash trees dying by the millions around here. And if we have a, a small forest of dead ash, uh, is there a balance in how many we can cut for firewood versus what we should leave for, uh, you know, birds and insects? Right. Um, of course, the emerald ash borer, another insect from, from uh, China, <coughs> has killed a lot of ashes. Uh, there is a peak in woodpeckers when you get those ash, ash die-offs. They'll come in for a couple of years. Um, so I would wait till that is over. Uh, but then those trees can be valuable snags. For the woodpeckers that then nested them and, and uh, then the birds that follow that. But you don't need 100 snags. So I would pick the biggest ones and you can weed out the other ones, open up the light. The real danger when you have that ash die off is all the invasives that are going to come in with that extra light. So you want to you wanna replant with something that's going to start throwing shade again. No. You, 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 have, you have caught on. I mean, this, so it was a big specimen tree. It's, it's from China, and it's beautiful, but now it's sick. Cut it down and put in a, a productive native. You, instead of trying to save a sick tree, you, just, just, you can move your trees out through attrition, and you've got attrition, so take advantage of it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so tell me, I'm going to be uh, signing Okay, thanks. Uh,